All right. Very excited about this today. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. I am excited about what God is doing, excited about this opportunity to share some success stories with you, um, to put some hope and bring some hope to your life. Hey, Pastor Taylor, great to see you. Uh, we're going to be doing some interviews on this broadcast. It's called Success Stories with Pastor Rudy Mosley. And because there are a lot of success stories out there, how God has transformed people's lives and he's moved in people's lives and he's made a difference in people's lives. Well, I think I think I know what happened, Pastor Sheen. Um, you got to watch it on your, your handheld device as opposed to uh, your computer. Uh, so if you want to swap with your wife and get her phone, then I'll be able to bring you on through her phone. Hey, Carla, how are you doing? Amen. God is good. And so, just want to come on here and this is what's called success stories. And we just want to share some success stories about how God has been really transforming and changing people's lives, especially during this season where there's a lot of quarantine, a lot of folks are, some people might feel a little discouraged, but we just want to encourage you with uh, success stories. And so tonight I have an, 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 an inspirational young man uh, has an awesome story in terms of how God has turned his life around. Um, his, his name is Pastor Shane Lee, and he's gonna he's one of my spiritual sons, and he's going to be giving his testimony a little later. Uh, a little bit more volume. How is that? Is that a little better? He's going to be giving his testimony today. And um, All right, so let me see if I can bring him in right now. Yes. All right. Let me see if this works today. Ooh, very, very excited. Ooh, success stories. Please be sure to share this page with other folks because a lot of folks need some encouragement, especially during this season, especially during this um, uh, season that's, that we're going through right now. We need to hear some good stories, stories about how people's lives have changed and been turned around. There he is, Pastor Shane Lee. Woo! Finally, we've been trying to do this thing for a while. <laughs> it's been a while, and, and we're so thankful for this opportunity. I'm, I'm excited that he's able to come on this show. The show is going to continue for a while, um, and I've given a title to it. The title of this show is called Success Stories, because we have many success stories, and it's not that anyone's, it's not that every anyone's um, perfect. It's just that we're doing what we can, and God has truly made a difference in our lives. So, in terms of uh, Pastor Shane, I just want to read a little bit about him. <laughs> He's one of my spiritual sons. I'm extremely proud of him. Uh, he is uh, an awesome man of God. He's a young man who is living for God supporting his family, loving his wife, loving Jesus. So for all those folks out there that don't think that there's a positive young man, young men of color that's doing some great things for God, yes, there are. <laughs> and so I'm excited to have him on the show today. And, and we're going to talk a little bit. Um, I'm not sure, Pastor Shane, if there's some things that you want to share before we get to our uh, for our uh, any words that you may want to share with some folks that are watching, words of encouragement to encourage them in their in their walk with God. Just before we get into our discussion. Amen. Um, you know, I just want to say that you know God is all powerful. He's all knowing. He's omnipresent, and he with his with his power and with his love and his presence in your life overcome any obstacle, overcome any temptation, you truly can find the life that he has for you. Um, it is absolutely po uh, po possible, no matter how difficult things might seem right now, no matter how many times it seems like you hit up against the same kind of walls, if you just stick to your relationship with him, he's able to pull you through the other side. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. So I got question number one. Question number one. 
how long have you been saved? Like, how long have you been walking with the Lord? How long have you been walking with Jesus? You see, it's so funny. I was actually, <laughs> I was actually sitting here, you know, looking for uh, the earliest evidence of my salvation. Because I'll tell you, um, you know, when when I came to the Lord, there was just so much going on. Um, and I was sitting here, you know, the reason why you see me looking is because I was looking for my baptism certificate. <laughs> because that is really the earliest recorded, you know, date that I have on, you know, my personal salvation. But, you know, it was a while back, and I'm thinking about the year that it was. Oh, man. This had to be. Well, actually, 2013, wow. 2012, 2013, Amen. around this, around the summertime, and um, you know, so so it's been about that long, and I have to say, you know, this it, it's been a journey, um, and um, there have been times in my walk where, you know, at that time when I first got saved, there was just a lot going on. I didn't really feel regenerated. There were definitely other times where I felt like, okay. This is when it actually happened. But I would say 2011, actually 2011, to be honest, because I think that's the year that's on my new member's certificate from the first church that I joined. So, uh, Amen. So that's, that's what, about nine years? Yeah, I would say, yep, that's, yep, exactly, yep, about nine years. For nine years. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's, that's great to hear. Now, how'd you come to the Lord? Like, what was your story? Like, how, how'd you first get introduced to him? Um, what 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 was it like? Well, you know what? It's, that's so funny. Um, I was introduced to him when I was a child. Okay. But it wasn't from my family. You know, my family didn't necessarily, you know, the majority of my family didn't necessarily come from, like, a church background where they were raised in a church. And, I mean, some of them were involved in different, you know, groups, but not to the, you know, you think of raised in a church like that sort of Southern style, you know, you had the mom and aunt and grandfather who had them fancy hats on and he was <laughs> old in Sunday school. So, you know, it definitely wasn't church in that sense. Um, but um, I was young and um, I was a little boy and I was, I was, I was living on this street in South Providence. And um, I remember I had this friend Cody down the street and I didn't hear anything about God or Jesus or things like that. You kind of knew from the sort of like familiar sense of things where people would say certain things, you know, certain sayings. So you would look up to the sky and you, you thought about the concept of God. But I remember my first time going down there and meeting his friends. He was my friend, Cody. He was this white kid who lived down the street. You know, not that matters, but it's a detail of the story. And um, I remember going into his house and his parents talking about it. And they took me to this church service that they were going to. And I think I just asked my aunt willy nilly or whatever. And uh, I went to this church service with them. We watched this video and they were presenting this idea or whatever. And I think that was kind of like my first serious running with God. And it was funny because my response was fear because of course I, I, I got to this event that was really only about, you know, I think the biggest thing I remembered was where people go if they didn't know God. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's what was presented on the video. So I remember being just, you know, sort of afraid because I didn't know how to find him. And I was so worried about all my other family members who wasn't at this event with me. I'm like, do they know? And oh, my goodness, and what's going to happen? And so, you know, that was um, that was when I was first introduced. And then growing up, I think God was always trying to call me, always trying to pull me. But I was always so resistant to him. There was this one other church that I joined, you know, when I was younger, maybe about um i say maybe about 13 years ago and I joined for a little while and I was really going, but I think the call of life always pulled me back out. The allures of worldly, you know, notoriety and fame and, and chasing after the other dreams that other people had. And, you know, I didn't want anything to do with Jesus or God because I just didn't want to be shackled. I wanted to do my own thing as they say. And so I left them even after those two encounters I would even make fun of my friend. One of my friends had, had found Jesus and he would try to come and talk to me about it. And I would say, don't come over here with that Jesus stuff. I'd make fun of him, crack on him, laugh in his face. <laughs> he was, a, you know, a, you know a, a Jesus chaser, you know, but it was definitely, you know, how I got, you know, introduced to him, how I got, how I was called by him 
in my latter years is a whole different story. But that Amen. would be some of my first introductions. Amen. So so let's let's go right into that in terms of your, your story, in terms of how the conversion took place. Because I know many people get introduced to the Lord, and it's like any kind of relationship you can get introduced to somebody. Hey, how you doing? My name is so and so, and you got the formalities, the shaking of the hands. Then mm -hmm. something happens when the relationship gets a little bit closer. <laughs> and then there's yeah. something that, that happens. And so if you could let our, our viewers know in terms of your story, in terms of how how the conversion took place, in terms of like what and, – and we have some other questions that we have. You may want to ask some of these – answer these some of these questions first in this question. Like what did, what exactly did he deliver you from? Like what, what, was, what was the old Shane like in terms of like what exactly did God – I, I want I want the viewers to hear the work of the Lord in terms of how he's transformed you. So what's your story? How, how was the encounter? And what did he pull you out of? Amen, amen. I would say, you know, I had a pretty, um, you know, I, certainly from everything I learned now, I would definitely not dare say, you know, the, the worst or the toughest, you know, childhood by any stretch of the imagination because as you grow up, you get to look around the globe, you get to see what, you know, real struggle looks like but you know from my own perspective as a child when i was growing up i you know i had my difficulties in my childhood and things of that nature you know you know back in 1994 when i was seven you know i lost my my mother um she passed away through um cancer lymphoma cancer of the lymph nodes and you know my father at that time had his own struggles you know as a grown man i look back and see and i realized that you know he wasn't able to be there for me um, in my day-to-day -day life. But, you know, when I got older, I realized, you know what, he had his own story. He had his own struggle. But for whatever the case might be, I didn't also have him in my life. And I was um, taken in by my, by my aunt, who's my mother's sister, who, you know, raised me as her own, you know, grateful Thank for that. Thank God for them aunts. Yeah, yes. Thank God for them aunts, man, I'm telling you. And so, you know, that's one thing I'll definitely say about, you know, the Lee family is that through all of our struggles, one thing is you, you know, you could never catch them just, you know, you know, hanging you high and dry or leaving you there, you know. Yeah. You'd have to be like a fifth offender or something like that, but you was always <laughs> on somebody's couch or always in somebody's house or something unless you was constantly doing something. I mean, anybody's going to, you know, fall to that. But I grew up in that situation. You know, I had gone through, you know, a lot of stuff. You know, that, that type of loss cause, can cause depression. And my family was also plagued by a few generational curses that I'm glad to say I see breaking in so many ways. Amen. But, you know, just like any family back at that time, you know, I was born in 87, you know, yeah. um, you know, you know, 33 now. I was seven. It was 94 when I lost my mother. But just like many other families in, you know, South Providence, our family was plagued with things like alcoholism, plagued with things like, um, you know, um, either selling drugs or being a drug addict, plagued with things like, you know, just not able to, you know, families able to stay together. You know, you had the, the single parent um, household. You had things like that going on. You had, you know, a little bit of, you know, a, a, the violence. You had these things that you went through. And, you know, I, I experienced things in my childhood, too. Besides just the loss of my mother, I experienced, you know, um, you know, again, in my own surmise and my own interpretation, things like abuse, you know, um, neglect you know not all from the person i was living with either you know when you're growing up in in the hood you know that you have interactions that your parents don't even know about you know things that happen to right, you and right stuff right right like so whether it's physical abuse sexual abuse i mean you name it i've experienced it all growing up and it has really really impacted my life yeah and it's just followed me throughout the years in ways that i recognize now in ways that only jesus could um could um could deliver me from so you know one of yeah. the biggest things that happened was losing i was the youngest out of four children my mother and i had looked for love in all the wrong places i yeah. mean i had all the wrong influences and all the wrong role models you know and so i looked for love in all the wrong places you know i you know i acted up in school just like anybody else i was trying to find my identity i had an identity crisis like nobody else can believe um and so you know going through that that's why I had all these broken relationships. First of all, I had the wrong identity. It was one time I was walking outside, you know, of, I think it was my grandmother's house, my mother's mother. And she lived, I can't even remember really where it was, but I know that there used to be a, a bush somewhere where I would go and pick rhubarbs and straight even raw or blackberries or whatever. And then there was a park across the street. And then there was a, 
uh, or lease that you can climb down and go to the corner store through the other side. My, some of my family that are here don't know the exact house I'm talking about. But I found this R. Kelly album. It was just the casing. It was on the floor. And yeah. I remember picking it up, and I turned it around. And in honor, he called himself the R&B king. And I said, man, I would like to be able to call myself the R&B king of Rhode Island. Right. And that's when that identity got born. You know, yep. I, was, I was a singer. God blessed me with a voice to sing. Yeah. But I use it for all the wrong reasons. I wanted to be famous like him. Yeah. I wanted to have all the girls. I wanted to yeah. have the riches, the fame. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I had this, you know, I was chasing after that identity. And, you know, in my mind, I was going to get rich. I could do a couple good things with that money. I wanted, like, 12 girlfriends in a jacuzzi in some mansion somewhere. <laughs> right. You know, all at the same time. <laughs> you know right, 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 so, right. I mean, I was tripping. I would go to clubs. I was in and out of relationships, right, and, you right, know, right, with right, girlfriends. Right, right. Real quick, just hit a note real quick. Just sing sing like a, a little, little phrase or something, just real quick. I want the listeners to hear that you you got a voice. <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Yes. Amen. So, so it wasn't a yeah. pipe dream. <laughs> <laughs> so you know you know i'm using it now for the right reasons but you know so growing up in life made a lot of mistakes did a lot of wrong things chased all the wrong things you know i ended up in a predicament in my life by the time you found me where i had gotten um real heavy off the alcohol i had ended up with you know one of my biggest sh shames at one point in time i was like i had three different um uh three di i had three children with three different baby mothers and three different child support cases. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I was just really tripping. I was leaving the trail of broken hearts. I'd be clubbing. I'd be drinking and getting drunk every chance I could get. Wow. Waking up after blacking out, not right. remembering where I was from. Wow. I was a deadbeat dad. You know, I wasn't in my kid's life. I was just repeating all the same generational curses. Right. You right. know, dropped out of college, barely made it in there in the first place. Wow. You know, couldn't hold the job down to save my life. Right. Wow. You know, I was just tripping. I mean, I most people would look at me because everyone judges you based upon who's around you. So most people would look at me and be like, ah, oh, he wasn't really, he's not the worst I've seen. He wasn't toting guns. He wasn't right. this and that. But I was the worst I've seen. I was the worst I needed to see. Right, right, right. You know, so, but I was just so full of pride. You know, I thought I was all that. Thought I was fine. Thought I was the next R. Kelly. Thought I was, <laughs> you know, thought I was going to be rich, some famous R&B singer traveling right. the world, doing what I want. You know, and um, it came to a point where life started to hit me, man. And, uh, you yeah. know, when I had my first child, I was like, I can still swing this. You know, and then I ended up having my daughter and I was like, all right, what are you doing, Shane? I was like, you know what? I'm still fine. I can still swing this. Right. And then my son came and I started to realize that you're doing exactly what you said you wasn't going to do. You, you're yeah. looking just like yeah. everybody else out here that you said you wanted to do better for. Yeah. Yeah. And when I, when because of the decisions I made, it affected me financially. I got child support. I got locked up from child support a couple times. Yeah. Um, I dropped out of um college at URI because I couldn't focus on my studies there. I didn't think I was smart to begin with, anyways. Right. And I ended up being diagnosed with major depression. Yeah. You know, and I uh, got to the point where I wasn't leaving my home. I wasn't eating. I wasn't showering every day. Maybe every two days, every three days, whatever. I mean. I was really like in the thick of it, and um, wow. you know, I wow. I was I was dealing with multiple women, you yeah. know, Providence, Newport, whatever you name it, and it was one time when God finally struck me on the on the head, if you will, and I was leaving I was leaving the Providence girl, if you will, to go to the Newport girl, and I was I was um, in the car and I was getting ready to drive, and I just heard God's voice, His yeah. voice just woke out to me, his voice just reached out to me and it said, um, he said, I remember when your mom died, you said to her memory that you was going to love women, right. that you was going to respect right. women, that you was going to be different, that you was going to, that you was going to find the version of her and be faithful to her and be kind yeah. and not be yeah. violent, that you was going to redeem her memory by, in a sense, becoming the kind of man that she could be proud of. Yes. You know, and it was like you said you you've done almost everything you said you never was gonna do in regards to woman and alcohol and not being there for your kids. And it was like, how did that happen? 
Yeah. When did that happen? How did you go from, mom, you died, and I'm going to love and honor and respect woman to, you know, what you became now? Yeah. Like, and you know something? What I discovered, right, is that there are a lot of us who make major, major commitments to God as kids. And we say, we'll never do this. We'll never do this. We'd never do this. And then we end up doing those things. We get a little bit older. And it's like the dream turns into a nightmare. And yeah. you know, what, what, what I'd like for you to talk about now is like that nightmare moment and how God, how God began to, to, um, cause I know you, you got a book in you <laughs> and the book, I think the book title was, uh, from wait, the prison to the pulpit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know you well, from prison to the future. So yeah, again, like I said, I, I would drink alcohol. So I would get, I drunk it. I drunk to get drunk, you know, I, I drunk to get drunk. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, ain't nothing wrong with it. Just, no, I only drunk to forget, forget stuff, you know? And so I even got violent. I even, I even hit women in my past, you know, um, when it came to that, if I got angry enough, or if we was in enough yeah. of a fight, you know, and one time, it, you know, it was, um, I ended up getting in a, a, a tough situation because when you drink and you get drunk and you're dealing with all them spirits, yeah, yeah. You know, um, the spirits enter in, and they cause you to try to do anything. So, I remember the night this one argument that I was having, um, you know, with um, my youngest son's mother, and uh, you know, I, I was drinking. I was already drunk by the time we was having this disagreement, and this argument, and this altercation. And all I know, because I, I couldn't even remember, all I know is that, you know, I ended up putting my hands on her that night. Yeah. And uh, she ended up calling the police, you know, yep. and there was a, another struggle and another tussle. And, um, you know, when they got there, she had said something serious enough that caused them to lock me up and bring me bring me down there, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. I won't go through all the crazy details right. like that, but she had said some stuff serious enough, and I was literally in prison. That was yeah. another place I never thought I would go. Yeah, I was yeah. I was supposed to be the good one, the smart yeah, one, yeah. you know that that kid. That's you know, my, me and my brother was supposed to be like black and white, you know, yeah. and all this other stuff. And um, you know, here I am in prison, and and yeah. it was like a dream to me. I was like in the back of a police car. I got when I got to the to the prison cell, um, in downtown Providence. I, it wasn't real to me. And then when they brought me over to the ACI, yeah, and they brought me to D Block. Yeah. They call it, I mean, H block, actually, they call it hell block. It's supposed to be the worst mod and in intake, yeah. you know. And when I ever walked in there, and that steel door said, Rrr! it became real. Wow. So now I'm out of my, I'm out of my kid's life. I'm, I'm in, in, in prison facing a capital offense. Wow. I'm supposed to be there for a very long time of life, oh according goodness. to the allegations that were against me. And um, I was like, man, how did all my dreams? I said, my whole life is dumb. Wow. One decision. And I remember not listening to God because I knew God at this point. You know, I would yeah. go back to how he called me. But I was, I had met you already. I was in Bread of Life already. I was in the middle of Bible school. The yeah. one that I'm now running, that's a testimony in itself. <laughs> but um, he told me one time when I was at the library, he said, you're my son and alcohol will never touch thy lips again. Yeah. I was walking into the library when he said that. When I left the library, the devil said, well, what's wrong with a little alcohol? There's a free alcohol tasting spot down here today. You can get the alcohol and be on the city bus, and it's it'll so be subtle. like your upper echelon. You know, here you are on the back of the city bus sipping on some wine. Like, you can be, like, special. Yeah. So I went into that wine thing, and I didn't take one cup of wine. I didn't come out of there until I was already completely out of my mind. And that's when this altercation happened, and I ended yeah. up in prison. God's voice was there earlier in that same day. Yeah. And he said, my son, alcohol will never touch thy lips again. Yeah. I agreed with him. But when I left the library, I heard the other voice and I responded to it. And I ended up in a situation that I thought was going to change for life. And I was scared. Yeah, It was new to me. There was nobody I could call for help. None of my political connections mattered. None of the, uh, the activism that I did or accolades that I had or certificates that I got, none of that mattered anymore. Because in the real world, like when it comes to people you know in these places and you get into this kind of trouble, they disassociate themselves from you anyways. They don't want to mess up their own name. They don't right. want to mess up their own chances to get reelected or to do other things like that. So you thought they was your friends, but they were your friends while your image served them. Right. You know what I'm saying? 
And so I just remember being in there thinking my life is done. And, and I was sad and I cried and I was like, this is a nightmare. You know, I went to sleep in that cell and I fully expected to wake up in my bed at home. And I woke right. up in that cell. Yeah, I woke up in that cell with the steel door closed with all my rights taken away. I couldn't eat when I wanted to eat. I couldn't use the bathroom when I wanted to use the bathroom. I couldn't. And I was this promising kid with all this aspiration yes. and all this potential. And it was gone yes. because I did not listen to the voice of God. And and I was scared and I was going through so much. And, you know, my image, my reputation was destroyed. And I'm just like, at this point, I had a choice. And, you know, I woke up and and I finally came to a point in that prison, you know, um, where, you know, I was just like, you know what, God, if I'm going to spend life in this prison, um, I don't want um, it to be all the loss. Right. I said, you had a plan for my life and this wasn't it. But I said, you know what, God, um, so that the devil doesn't get the final say, I will yeah. minister from in here. And I right. said, every single man that you want to send in here, I will minister to them. I will, I will tell them everything I know about the Lord. I'll send them back out there in the world and I will kick the devil's butt from in here. Yes. And I got over all the crying and all the soaking and all the everything. And I committed that to him, you know, and I would go to all the Catholic services. I'm telling you, we need more Pentecostal services in the prison. You have to go to a Catholic services and you just have to be down with them. If you're going to get any Bible, any semblance of word, we need to right. penetrate that system a little bit more because our, I mean, um, you know, our folks, um, for the Protestant side, will come there once a month, but the Catholic side had it unlocked. The Muslims even had more services in there. They could refuse certain foods based on their belief, but a Christian could never say nothing. Right. So we, you know, that's a whole nother story. But you know, when I made that commitment, I would still pray. I still wanted to get out so bad. I still wanted, I wanted everything to reverse. And again, it showed that my hope was in man because I had he sent in different cellmates at different times, and one of the cellmates was also somebody who was saved. His story was just like mine, but yeah. he was like an older version of me. Yeah. And I remember one time talking to the lawyer, and he was like, listen, man, they're not trying to budge. You know, you, you know, according to what was the allegations against you, you might have to get out and register and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, I remember walking back into my cell, and I said, I guess it doesn't matter who you know, huh? And my cellmate said, um, I'm sorry, it does matter who you know. And he pointed up. Hallelujah. To God, and I was like, Wow. And again, from my childhood, I wanted that. I was I was still looking for that savior and man. I was still looking for some rich white man to come rescue me because he had the skin and he had the money. He's gonna come rescue this poor black boy. Yeah. Somebody that seen me growing up with something. I had that or some politician that liked something I did was gonna speak on my behalf and rescue me. My connection was gone. They was gonna work for me, man. I, I, right. I, I sung the Black National Anthem at the State House a couple times. Like, <laughs> something's gotta work for me, man. You know, right. and um, it was like, they, don't matter them want nothing to do with you. They trying to get reelected. And right now, you look like, yeah, matter of fact, if they go against you, it might help their votes. You know, so it was like, I went into my cell and said, I guess it doesn't matter who you know. And he said, it does. And that shocked me. God started. God dealt with a lot while I was in that prison. It was when He first introduced me to His name Yahweh, by the way, which is why I hold that name so dear to my heart. Um, but um, He started dealing with some of that poison that was in me. In my book, it'll be in there. But He called me some names that hurt, man. He brought me through the history of every major relationship I had with a woman, and He reminded me of my demeanor, of my lack of respect, and my lack of honor. He reminded me of the way in which I was, and he put certain names on them. I mean, them names stung. Yeah. He was like, you would label this person that if they got caught in the news about this, but now I'm going to call you this. Yeah. So you can see that Jesus' standard is, even if it's in your heart, that's what you are. Amen. And if you're violent, and if you, um, you know, come against people like this, that's exactly what you are, you know? And so I started focusing on him. At that yeah. point in time, I changed my attention in the prison cell. I started becoming devoted. I prayed every day. I ministered every day. I, whenever I woke up in my cell, as soon as I woke up, my roommate experienced me jumping off the top bunk. I got on my knees in that cement and I prayed like Amen. the first hour, first hour and a half. Then I would read this devotional. And then we ended up going out there and I ended up ministering to other men. And we, I started a group in there called Heaven Block Believers because they called HMOD Hell Block. And so I said, let me turn it around. Let me shift it and call the heaven block believers. And, I, and we would have this table and we did this Bible study and men would come up and cry. 
one man who said, you know, he's going to have twins soon and he's stuck in here. Can you please pray for me? I prayed for him. Mm. He said, I had peace. He got released the next day before his twins were born so he could be there. You mm. know, one of the, um, it was kind of like a Joseph story because the CEO came to me one time and was like, yo, I really appreciate what you're doing in the mob there and what you're doing with the men and stuff like that. And I began to get favor. Mm. And um, I gave up all hope of ever getting out of there. And all my devotion was to the to God. Amen. I, I completely turned my heart from getting out of there and um, I, I was devoted to him, you know, and I would go to the Bible studies and stuff like that and speak to man. And he had me right. speaking on things even in there about the issue of e returning evil for evil and how that keeps the cycle going. How you look at a, a hurt man and you judge him and it keeps that cycle going. You know, um, the thing even came up about how does a Christian think about a rapist or a pedophile? And I said, you got to understand that that pedophile has his own story that when he was young, things happen to him that he wrongly executed. Now, the physical penalties of that should never go away. But you as a believer, if you condemn him spiritually, it just keeps him operating in that spirit. When you can restore him spiritually and he can turn around and restore others, you will actually save some children. But as long as you see that human being as the enemy and not the spirit behind it, you're just helping the enemy. Because the enemy already won over him and caused him to act out. Now you so-called Christians are hating him and you're helping the enemy's plan because it further cements the spirit that the enemy birthed in him. And I taught this lesson in prison. I said, this is why you have to see with the spirit because I'm trying to pull that evil spirit out of him and have him heal so that he'll use his testimony to go and talk to other men who are about to make the same mistake, mistake which would actually save some children down the line. Amen. So it just really, a lot of this stuff started to take place. And then, you know, as I started ministering to different groups and I wore my cross all the time, you know, there was one time when I was supposed to minister to this guy and, um, you know, um, I was supposed to, he wanted the cheese out of my sandwich. We were at child time and this chapter in the book is called, um, it's called, um, it's Ivan and the cheese is the name of this chapter because his name was Ivan and he wanted the cheese out of my sandwich and the spirit was leading me to give it to him. He also had mental problems. And at that time, the mental institutions didn't have space to deal with them. So they just took the mental um, men and just sent them to the prison. No wow. care, no love. And so he was like, I want your cheese. And there was another dude sitting by me too, who was a Christian man that got caught in something else from a whole other church. That's a whole other story. And I said to, I said, the spirit said, give him your cheese. And I said, um, no, I want my cheese too. Uh -uh. Imagine that. I said no to the spirit. <laughs> and I said, I I'm here in prison too. Like, I want to enjoy this sandwich. The food's bad enough as it is. I couldn't, I couldn't die to sell. And when I refused the, I refused the cheese, something really bad happened after that. The first thing was that he said, you know what? I don't know why you got that cross on your neck. I hate that symbol. You know why? Because Jesus never did nothing for me. And the spirit spoke up and said, I just wow. tried to shame through you. I tried to give him cheese. But you said no. So now he said, Jesus didn't do nothing to me. And he took his spork and he said, I'm going to stab you. So now my heart's beating. I'm in this predicament that again, so the Holy Spirit was telling me, you still haven't learned. Again, from not responding to my voice, you're in a predicament. I'm like, I'm about to get stabbed up in here. So I'm nervous. The CEO's walking around. He's only making like one revolution every so often. Right. So I'm like, surely I'm going to get jigged. And, and then I did. And, and he gave me a chance to redeem myself later when I when he was going through something. Everybody neglected this kid. He was crazy Ivan. Right. You know what I'm saying? And and, and as I saw, as my ministry at HMR got stronger, I said, listen, I, I don't know what happened before or why you got upset with me, but I want you to know I'm here for you if you ever need me. Mm -hmm. And it changed his perspective. And he literally, at child time next time, he literally made men pass his apple over to me because he just wanted some way to express love, even in all his mental illness, even in everything. Wow. So there was redemption there. But one day, one day, all I know is with no court case, not appearing before the judge, not anything, this, my cell door started to open. And I remember my cell block, it was 107 top. And the CEOs called out over the loudspeaker, 107 top, pack your veins, you're going home. I said, this has to be some joke. This has to be, they're playing with me right now. You know, because they played with me before. I remember one time I was crying to get out my cell to get out the church service. And everybody else in the block that knew me was screaming out of their door, let him out. He's the only one who really follows Jesus for the right reason. He's not just trying to get out of their cell. And they were like, <laughs> why don't you worship Jesus in your cell? Ha, 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 ha. And I remember crying. And I was like, they even took away my freedom to worship the Lord. That's, again, before my concept of worshiping him was elevated to know that it don't matter where I was. Right. I wanted to get to that to that service. Um 
So they said that, and when I went out, um, you know, you know, there's a whole other story of one of the Muslims in that mob that I that I ended up interacting with. But when I got out there, I had my bag, and then all the men in the whole block gathered around me, the ones that were out on recess, and they were all there. Now, I thought they, at the time, I thought they were all there because they loved me. I mean, a lot of them were there because of the relationship we built. But you know, they tried whatever you don't not gonna take with you. Like, let right. me get that. Let me let me get them thermals. Let me get them. You know, they're yeah. trying to get what they can get. You know, and so, um, but I remember him coming up, you know, the Muslim guy even coming up and I was like, you know, continue seeking truth because we had a dialogue back and forth. And I remember packing my clear bags, you know, them clear bags they give you, they give you a rip kick. You can't, everybody knows who you came from when you get on that bus with that clear bag, <laughs> man. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And um, so when I went out there, nobody was there to pick me up. Nobody, I, I, I never went to court. I never came before a judge. I was just released out to Reservoir Avenue. Oh, and I started walking. And I remember being afraid. I said, this has to be a mistake. They made a mistake. So I started walking faster because I didn't want the COs to realize they made a mistake and come and grab me and put me back in there. Yeah. So I just started walking down the street. I had no phone, no money, no nothing. And I just started walking down the street. The only thing I knew to do was go to my oldest son's mother's house to try to get some way of contact and then, and then get a ride home, which I did. And... um. And I realized, you know, later on, I went, you know, to the courthouse to clear things up. But God had released me Amen. from my sentence, my rightful sentence, and um, also completely erased every record of it. Everything was expunged. It was as if it had never happened. Miracle. The same way Jesus did it, as if you had never sinned. It is as if you had never sinned. Miracle. He gave me a second chance, man. Miracle. And, but that was the biggest scare of my life. That was my lowest point. That was my nightmare. Yes. You know, and um, again, he, he had called me, like I was saying, out of making me realize that I had done everything I said I would never do. And the only thing he did when I heard his voice was he gave me the image of the last church I remember being in. And so I went to that church at Ebenezer Baptist Church on the Carl Baylock on Cranston Street. And that's where my journey started and where I was baptized. And then I ended up in you know, I ended up in another ministry called Legions of Christ Ministry, and I started learning about the grace of God. And then I remember when God moved me to your church, to your house, and I remember visiting. My sisters were begging me for the longest time, come to my church, check out my church, check out my pastor, <laughs> St. and Dottie. You know, and they were just like, you know, for the longest time. And when I went, the difference was the relationship that you started to cultivate. And I remember crying at the altar with my eyes closed, and somebody was hugging me. I opened my eyes and it was you. And I was like, you mean to tell me the head pastor's not too uppity and not too busy to to, to just come down and wrap his arms around me? Because that was different in other cultures. It was like the head pastor was always far removed. He had his he had his robes, he had his position, you know, and you could talk to one of the deacons. You know, and as I got into the van, I was in the back of my sister's van, all I could say going home, and I felt it. It was like a cool rushing water going in circular motion. And I felt it. God is saying, this is your church. You're to move here. This is where you will be. And I kept saying, I can hear God. I think God the whole way home. I was doing like this. I think God is telling me to move to this church. No, I hear God. He's telling, he's telling me that this is the church. I'm supposed to. So imagine having some grown man in the back of your van doing that all the way home. I know my sister was annoyed, but I just never heard him so clearly moving me. And it was because you was the example of a father and a husband. Someone who's been there and done that. You had similar things. And that was my biggest pain. My biggest pain was a broken home. My biggest pain was a broken relationship, which is why I was looking for love in all the wrong places. And I was looking for, thought I was looking for a wife or was looking for a mommy. And I would find broken woman because I was broken and break them even further as they broke me continually. Yeah. And it was just a bad cycle. And so oh, he's God. like, I'm going to put you somewhere where fatherhood is demonstrated. The fatherhood principle is there where husbandry is demonstrated and where marriage is demonstrated so that you can have something to look at. And that's when the journey began, man. And I remember I was still in a lot of sin when I got to your church. I was still <laughs> doing a lot of stuff. I was still drinking. I was still dealing with multiple women. I was still, and you just looked me in the eye and you shook my hand and you said, I'm committed to you. Uh, and that was before the whole prison stint happened. And I was, I looked at you like, dude, you don't know what you're getting into because I'm broken. <laughs> They're committed to me. I was like, all right, we'll see you run like all the rest of them when you really figure out, you know, just how broken I am. So, but, um, you know, God is so good because uh, as time went on, he began to put his fingers on, finger on things and just deliver 
you know, one step at a time from different things. I remember the time he delivered me from alcoholism because that stuff used to call me. And a lot of people didn't think I was an alcoholic because they're like, well, you don't drink every day and you'll go to work, you know, some, and so you functioning or whatever. No, no, no. And the fact that when it called me, I could not say no. Right. That's another right. the definition right there. Right. And I couldn't walk by a liquor store or nothing. I would bum and try to put together change and get it together too. I mean, yeah. you know, um, so... You know, I remember when he took the taste of that out of my mouth. Amen. And I no longer desired it. Hallelujah. I walked I walked down, I drove by down the same streets that had the same liquor stores on them. And when I got to the end of the street, I realized that I hadn't I hadn't looked to the left or to the right. Amen. Yes. Yes. And, yes. and liquor has not touched my mouth since. Praise him. You Hallelujah. know, um I, I, I remember he delivered me from he 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 gave me self control enough to live a whole to live to live a pure life. There's Amen. a period of my time where I lived in purity, which I never could do before. If I got lonely enough or sad enough, I always ran back to that familiar spirit, that familiar house, that familiar control. Yeah. And he allowed me enough of that, you know, to, He's to awesome. find out what love really was with him. He's and awesome. um there was a point when I didn't think I was worthy of love. You remember me telling you that, Pastor Rudy. I'm not worthy of love. I'm never going to find a wife. I'm like, <laughs> look at me. Three kids? Right. Three different baby mothers? Three different child support cases? Right, I remember. And a bunch of other financial problems? Right. Credit report broken down? Like, who's going to want me? I said, I might as well just ask God for the gift to be like, um, you know, to be like Paul. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, you prophesied over my life and you said, you know, I don't see that. Not only do I see you finding love, I see God restoring your children to you. You know, and you know, sometimes I'm like, man, this quack. He's just he just believes too much. <laughs> like, you know, and surely enough, God brought me my wife, my beautiful wife, Michelle Maria Lee, that yeah! fine sister girl, that woman of God, that Proverbs yeah! thirty one, that 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 hero, you know. Uh, she was like my hero. You know, and she came in, man, and that's a whole nother testimony I don't have time to get into, but she saw all of my problems up front, and those problems were coming in her face. Yeah. Like, presenting themselves, big mama drama, financial constraint, yeah. didn't even have a license because that was suspended. She had to do all yes. the driving. I'm, yes, and at different man. points before we got married, yeah, I was man. like, you know, you can leave, you can run. Because yeah. I was like, I don't even know why you're here. Right. And every time I thought she was going to run because something jumped off, I would look to her and I expected to see her walking away. And she would turn back to me and say, I'm not going anywhere. Hey, man, God bless you, man. Bless you with a gift, man. God bless you with a gift. Something else crazy would happen with the kids or finances or the big mother drama or all that stuff. I'm like, Girl, you can run now. She turned back to me and say, I'm not going to anywhere. Yeah, man. God has blessed you, brother. Bless you. God has blessed you. God has and blessed so, you. And um, so, at this point in time in my life, um, I'm married to one woman, a faithful husband. God restored my children to me. Yeah, you know man. What I'm saying? That's we what own a about. home. We're homeowners. Home owners my kids that I was deadbeat dads to, God moved in court cases. And <laughs> men don't win these cases, not in Rhode Island. I got full, you know, uh, physical custody of my daughter, full custody of my son. You know, yeah, 21 man. is my oldest son. And I'm blessed with that because I have the greatest relationship with, you know, with his mother and, and her, her, her husband of like 10 years, um, you know, that they've been together so long. And so I'm able to be an example to them. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not drinking. I'm not smoking. Uh, I will it, always get fired and let go from jobs. I've been at this job now for six years straight. I never <laughs> thought that could happen. Yes! You know, God healed the depression. God healed uh, a lot of Hallelujah. the generational curses. And I stand Hallelujah. as a beacon to uh, reach back to men, you know, who went through things that I went through. And right now, you know, I'm committed to looking for those other shames that are out there. Amen. You know, you can never grow lazy in the work of evangelism because there's there's other men and other women out there like you who are in the predicaments that you were in and can't yeah. see a way out. Yeah, man. So you have to be serious about 
training yourself up in the word of God in, 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 the, in the ministry of prayer because there's a work that needs to be done. There's other lost souls out there that God is broke has a broken heart about. Amen. And it just takes someone to be obedient. Imagine if you had never said yes to God, I would have never ran into you. And this is a triple effect. You're, uh, we can't be selfish. Our life is not our own. It's not. There, there are other people, places, and things that are that their deliverance is attached to our obedience. Amen. And so, man, I tell you, for all intents and purposes, I should be dead. Yeah. There's many times I drove drunk and hit 360s and dirt mounds and went up in the air uh, driving drunk and, and doing 360s and everything else. There was many times, and, you know, I've been in situations where people broke into my sister's home and they had a four-fifth pointed at my forehead. Yeah. And I was supposed to say goodbye then, you know, because they thought there was something in the house they wanted. There's many things that I did wrong, ways that I disrespected or sinned against women or men or women who were attached to certain men and been yeah. in certain predicaments, you know, and chased by a gang into the corner of a house, knives and sticks and guns, like the stuff I was doing. There ain't no difference from me and another man who's just not here. I should be dead yeah. or in jail serving a life sentence. Those are the only rightful. That's all I deserve. But God in his mercy said that God. he had a plan. God. He had a plan, Hallelujah. you know, and so I'm just living a life that I never imagined I could. Sometimes I still look around, and there was a time when I couldn't go nowhere, do nothing, couldn't drive. I was all locked down. You know? I remember. The debt, you know, my license was on lockdown. My passport was on lockdown. I was a prisoner of the state, basically, because of my debt. I um, couldn't find a job, couldn't keep a job, and uh, I, all I did with my spare change was drink. You know, I walked around with a 40, 40 bottle of old English under my arm in a brown paper bag. Amen. Joke and laugh about stuff. And that was that was really what was up, you know. And um, God has me in a, in a whole other stratosphere right now. And, um, you know, Amen. and again, you know, God's healing is progressive sometimes. You don't, he took away those egregious sins from me, took away those addictions. But he's revealing to me in my season now certain attitudes or certain yeah. concepts that he wants to break off now yeah uh you go back into your childhood and and, and identify low self-esteem or insecurity yeah. or certain things that have been locking my gift up he's in the process of breaking those things off now yes he is but i mean my kids go to bed to me praying for them and tucking them in in their own rooms their you know these rooms. are just these things that are simple to most people that are just like oh that's just normal is amazing to me sometimes i sit back i mean i'm in my own office you know, I have my office space in my own home where I can plan and strategize and build life, you know, and, and, and minister from. And I'm just like, it shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't be. And I realize that I'm a steward of all, possessor of none. Everything belongs to God. And I'm accountable to him that my Amen. gifts, talents, and abilities, time, money, and resources are used to advance his kingdom. That I'm not Hallelujah. so selfish that I would forget about the other things that are out there still waiting. Amen. You know, and so there's there's so much work to do. But that that's a... A little bit of my story in a nutshell. I mean, I, I really should be out of my mind. I should be still on that major depression bed. They sent me to the head of the counseling center. I saw, I went to the CEO's office. They, I wasn't with none of his people that worked under him. I went right. to the head of the therapist department at URI, and I would go all the way up to the top floor and sit on his couch, <laughs> you know. Um, and so literally, Woo. I mean, Woo. man, my mind was so messed up because of my life. That at any given time, I, I was like, do I have adult ADHD? I'd have a thousand thoughts at any given time, and all of them would be wrong or messed up in some way, you know, in, in pure and pure. And he, you know, he had given me direction to fast. I had to do an absolute fast every single Monday. Yeah. You know, so, so much blessing and obedience. <laughs> and there was a season in my life where Sunday at midnight, I wouldn't eat again until Tuesday morning. And right. during that fasting and pray would release and break certain things. So, I mean, it's really now where it's like, God, what, what is your expectation now? You know, what do you want now? What do you, I owe you everything. I owe you all. And I think right now he's just pushing his finger on me, releasing my gift, which has been held up. I mean, I've been, I've made so many excuses about why I don't sing or write my own songs or release projects. And literally it was because of certain bondages that I still had. He started revealing those things through different events, different places I would go. And he yeah. would reveal that insecurity. He would reveal that low self-esteem, believe it or not, poor self-image. He would reveal concerning my gift. 
he would reveal that comparing and contrasting the the as you would say be delivered from the opinions of a people he would reveal sort of this conglomerate of things and then also just not prioritizing and making time for it so he wants that released he wants me to continue um continue um in, in in his ministry but most of all in his relationship and intimacy so the challenge now is to stay faithful to prayer and faithful to his word to seek his kingdom first to continue to keep him first not to get distracted by the yeah. things of this world whether it's social media whether it's netflix whether it's binge watching but to really redeem the time for the days of evil and realize that we're in the last days and you know and that um you know i'm to be very serious about finding out what his will for my life is so i can be in the center of his will I can become all he wants me to become and accomplish all that he wants me to be accomplished. So there's albums in my future. There's books in my future. There is, you know, albums and books in my wife's future. There's dreams exactly. and stuff in my kids that I have to release. So it's just a matter of, of understanding. And so I'm just committed to him, uh, committed to the kingdom, committed to bread of life and his vision through that church and just um, committed to, to men. I want to yeah. see men restored. You know, I want to see, I want to go find those bees. Amen. And um, I want to see men restored to their children, men re men restored to their posts, yes. um, yes. especially in the church, starting in the church, and then see them restored to their posts in the community. Amen. Um, if God did it for me, he can do it for them. Hallelujah. You, you know, know, Pastor Shane, I'm extremely proud of you. Um, extremely proud of you. And, you know, watching your, your transformation and then continuing to watch your transformation. I know there were a lot of people that didn't know the full extent of your story and the full extent of what God has delivered from, delivered you from and what the power of sin that he broke off of your life. And so even as I watch your life, it encourages me to preach even more because it's the gospel works you follow god he says i know the plans i have for you plans to prosper you and not to harm you if you take a chance on me your life will never be the same and and that's what he says he said give me a chance give me a chance to transform your life and so you're you're now my executive pastor <laughs> i'm your i'm your number two man as they say yes and so and and the thing for me is as 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 a pastor, just watching God do it in people's lives, and I'm so extremely proud of you and your wife. Extremely proud of the the father you are. I'm extremely proud of the husband that you are. The you're the administrator of our Bible school as well. Um, God has blessed you with your home. He's blessed you with your children. He's made you an example even to the remainder of your family. And so that is awesome. It's awesome to see. And I really thank you for your honesty and openness because I know that the listeners that are listening to this broadcast will be blessed because you are a success story. Your life is a testimony. And, and God's not done yet. God's not done with the Lee family. He's not done with what he wants to do and what he wants to showcase in and through you. So I'm excited, excited, excited about what God is getting ready to do and continue to do in your life, man. Certainly Amen. About it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And I just want to say, you know, I want to, I want to thank you for your obedience. I want to thank you as my spiritual father, and um, thank your wife as my, um, you know, spiritual mother, Pastor Toya, um, and really just the example that you guys give and your love for one another. Um, I definitely couldn't be where I am now and um, get to where I was without the love and support of, you know, both you guys, the Mosley crew and uh, Bread of Life International Worship Center, um, you know, couldn't have been done. Yes, I, all glory, all honor, all credit, and all praise be to God. But we're also thankful for those vessels that say yes to him in the process of being used in someone's life. So I also, you know, say thank you and that you're you're an example and you're, uh, you're a, God will use you as a deliverer, you know, as, you know, someone, you know, just the spirit that you have for the flock it's very genuine and very true and, and, and very sincere. And, you know, so God has called you to this, you know, yeah. when you said you was committed to me, I said, this dude don't even know what he's getting himself into. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, something yeah. though, Pastor Shane, it's, it's, it's the thing that God said to me. He said to me when I was in my mess and I was doing crazy. And I mean, people like my, I'd say my older sister, she probably, Laverne, she, she has seen the transformation herself because she's seen what I was even when I was, well, she's older than me, so she's seen me since I was born. <laughs> but she's seen the whole transformation. 
And God said those same words to me. What he said to me was, I'm committed to you. I, I, I see what you don't see. I see what you can't see. I see what he's placed in you. And that's the way we have to look at everybody. We have to look at everybody through the eyes of faith. A person may be really messed up, broken, busted, and disgusted, but God has placed potential on the inside of everybody. God has placed greatness on the inside of everybody. And people just have to be committed to watching God. And you have to do your part too, because there are things that you, know, you, you say to people, sometimes people listen, sometimes they don't. You listen. You listened and you applied and you said, okay, I'm going to apply this. All right, I'm going to apply that. And acceleration, fast track. Uh, God bless you with your wife. He bless you with your family. Bless you with another daughter, another child. I mean, mm -hmm. God is... That's awesome. what God can do. God can do so much with obedience and a little bit of time, you know. I spent all that time, you know, destroying my life. And when God did it four or five years, you know, now nine. Real you know, quick. I always say five years because the first four years he was trying to figure it out. But I think yeah. that's what makes the difference between a church member and a spiritual son or daughter is because they say that, you know, I first of all, naturally, I came looking for a father figure. Yeah. But sons and daughters of the house literally submit themselves. And that submission means that not only are they trusting you for guidance, but they are going to allow you to speak into their life and allow you to put your finger on things and allow you to correct and to rebuke and to receive it without attitude or backlash. They're going to yeah. agree with your vision. Your vision yeah. and point of view on a lot of things is my vision and point of view on a lot of things. Yeah. Some people have even misunderstood that at times. They're like, you know, I think you, you know, you follow him too closely, you know, you, whatever, you're your own person, think for yourself. And I'm like, you know, you got to understand, I do. It just so happens that God has wired me in such a way that... <laughs> My vision just agrees with his vision in a lot of places. And people, they're not used to seeing that. And that's what I think is missing in the church now is that true biblical submission where God says, you know, f follow those who are leaders among you. Don't make it burdensome to them for that won't be good for you. You right. know, and I right. could say that that's the difference between someone who's, you know, as our Bible school says it, there's a difference between someone who's for hire and someone who's a son or daughter of the house. And so. Um, you know, I just encourage other people too. If God has placed the spiritual leader in your life, you really, you really got to be humble enough to become a son or a daughter of that person. And that's different from just saying, I go to that church and that's my pastor. And exactly. most of what they say will hold a lot of weight. No, that is absolute. You know, as long as that person is following God and they can say, follow me as I follow Christ. And it's exactly. nothing against the word of God or nothing against the spirit of God that you are literally submitting to their guidance. They have right. safe soul. They have influence. They have not only come through relationship, you've seen them blood, sweat, and tears, you know, um, to help your life. And so you respond to that by saying, man, you know, you've purchased the right to speak into my life. You've, you've purchased the right to tell me something when I'm out of line, without right. me getting an attitude, without me getting upset. And while I while I follow that instruction, when you correct me, as if it's a very difference in today's day, we'll see the kingdom of God move a lot faster if people, you know, stop to understand this. I mean, at the beginning, you was dedicating a lot of time, giving me rides, spending time away from the home, and I was just like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know, Pastor Latoya is gonna like me after this. You brother was supposed <laughs> to be home two hours ago, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then you would literally sacrifice the time with you know your wife and kids sometimes, and. You see, you know, you, you treated me like a son, you know, so I, your wife literally sacrifices along with you. A lot of people that don't see everything you do as an extension of your wife, they don't understand the way the marriage works because everything you do affects your wife and kids. Jaden, um, Jalen, um, you know, Jace, you know, just, you know, they literally share you with those members of your church, your heart, your mind, things like that. You know, they're number one, according to the, the, the order of God. You know, they come before that, but they, but your wife literally shares you. And so I thank her for that. You know, times when you might have forgotten something or dropped the ball on something or missed something because you're ministering, you know, you forgot to get the food or whatever it was, you know, <laughs> like, you know, you know, and so, so I just, I just, I just want to honor you guys as pastors and as shepherds. You didn't come into this thing for fame, notoriety. You didn't come because you just wanted to be the most important people in some organization they call church. You came literally dedicated to the work of God and, and willing to sacrifice and count the cost. So, you know, hats off to both you and your wife. And God's not done with you guys yet, so I just can't wait to see what he, what he does. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Pastor Shane, thank you so much. This is, you know, we're going to close at this time. 
Um, this is the first in a series of success stories um, in terms of how God has has the ability to move mountains out of people's lives. And we pray that this will, this testimony will be an encouragement to so many souls. Please share it. Please tag folks in it um, so that people can hear. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So I would have you close out in prayer, Pastor Shane. And yeah, and then, what I'm going to do even before I close out in prayer is I got like a song that the Spirit is writing in my heart. Go ahead. Go ahead. Or as he does. And I'm just making up as I go. So it's something like, this is my testimony, God did not leave me lonely, one and only, who could deliver, who could deliver, yes, this is my testimony, Hallelujah. God did not leave me lonely, he was the one and only, one and only. who could deliver, who could have set Hallelujah. me free. This is my testimony. God did not leave me lonely. Lord, you're the one and only who could deliver, who could have set me free. Amen. This is my testimony. Yeah. Hallelujah. Did not leave me lonely. Yeah. God is the one and only who could deliver, who could have set me free. Come on now. Yeah. This is my testimony, my God. He did not leave me lonely. Jesus, he is the one and only. Who could deliver? Who could have set me free? This is my test. Go ahead. Oh, God, you are the one and only, my God. You did not leave me lonely. You are the one who could have set me free. One more time. This is my testimony, my God. He did not leave me lonely. He is, he is the one and only who could deliver, who could have set me free. This is my testimony. He did not leave me lonely. He is the one and only, one and only. who could deliver. Yes, Hallelujah. Who could have set me? Who could deliver? Who could have set me free? Amen. Praise that song was just given right now by the Spirit. Hallelujah. Your glory be to your name, Father God. We seal what you have done. Yes, Lord. God, we thank you. God, we honor you. God, we see your power before our eyes. Yes, Lord. God, you kicked the devil out of my life. You destroyed his uh, influence yes, and power over me. You saw yes, me under his feet and thank under you, Lord his Jesus. hands. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for doing it. And you came and broke thank you, him Jesus. away. Thank you, Jesus. You delivered me. Your thank you, Jesus. Your original plan for me. Your original you, image. You healed me. Thank you, Jesus. God, Jesus, God, you spoke a word into thank my life. Thank you, Jesus. You revived my spirit, God. Thank you, Jesus. And you delivered not only thank me, you, Jesus. but thank my you, Jesus. children's children's children. Thank you, Jesus. Be free. God, thank I Jesus. pray that every other man thank who is you, out Jesus. there in situations like I was, God, that yes, you Lord. set the church on fire. Yes, And we Lord. might leave the four walls and go out there, God, yes, and Lord. influence and touch people. Father God, I pray that everyone that hears this testimony understands yes, that it's not just for me. That if he did it for me, Hallelujah. he can do it for yes. them, Father God. Yes, God. I yes, decree God. and declare deliverance and yes, freedom God. from each and every man, woman, yes, boy, God. and girl who's ever yes, experienced God. the bondage yes, of sin, the power yes, and influence of sin, God. Yes, God. Jesus Christ, we honor you and we worship you. We glorify and magnify your name. We lift your Hallelujah. name on high. You said yes, that Lord. if your name be lifted high, you will draw all men unto you. You are the yes, one. God only true God, magnificent, Hallelujah. alpha and omega, beginning and the Lord. end, all powerful, all knowing, all present God, God the Father, God the Son, and God Hallelujah. the Holy Spirit. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible, the Hallelujah. one and only true God. There is no other God but you and no other God beside you. Yes, we Lord. honor you. 
right now, God, and we right decree now, and declare that we'll seek your kingdom first. Yes, we'll Lord. see other souls be saved. We'll see other testimonies. We yes, will Lord. literally pull them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your marvelous son. Yes, Lord. The devil doesn't stand a chance when the presence of God in your yeah. presence there is freedom in your presence there is the answer in yes, your Lord. presence there is healing in your presence there is truth in your yes, presence Lord. there is power and strength Hallelujah. and sustenance to last and to break through and to persevere and to continue on and to not grow weary and well doing in your presence there is everything that we're ever going to need Hallelujah! so God we lean on you and we say that we trust you and we love you, we trust you in Lord. the mighty name of Jesus we do pray amen, amen. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day in advance for all mothers. Um, God bless you. And we pray that you just have an awesome, awesome day tomorrow. Uh, we will have service tomorrow at 11 o'clock right here on, on the Bread of Life Facebook page. And it's also on YouTube. Please stay tuned for some of those um, clips, uh, invitations. And please share it, like, and share it. God is the one who makes the difference. God is the one who so we thank you, Jesus. God bless.